let's jump right in and talk about what is SPI, or SPI, if you like. Um, it stands for Serial Peripheral Interface, and it is everywhere. So I'll show you that. Uh, it's extremely common for ICs, or integrated circuits, meaning that a lot of dedicated chips uh, that you might find on DigiKey on a circuit card interface via SPI. So if you go down this list, um, I just typed in SPI on DigiKey and hit search. I found 112,000 results. Now just to put that in perspective, I typed in USB separately and I found 49,000 results. So for integrated circuits, SPI is more common than USB, which actually was surprising to me. I didn't expect that. But if you go down the list, you see a whole bunch of memories. Uh, let's see, right, just right there, there's 12,000 memory, memory chips. Um, that use an SPI interface, so things like SD cards is uh, one, or EEPROMs are very commonly used, SPI. Um, a lot of microcontrollers, 52,000 microcontrollers, have some sort of SPI interface on them, which is not surprising to me. Uh, I.O. expanders, specialized interfaces, display modules, LCDs, OLEDs, uh, all sorts of interfaces, data acquisition, ADCs, super common for analog to digital converters. Uh, SPI is a common interface for that, probably the most common for ADCs. Um, UARTs, yeah, a bunch of different things. SPI is ubiquitous, and if you're interfacing to an integrated circuit, there's a high probability that you might, if it's a digital, digitally controlled circuit, there's a high probability it might be an SPI uh, interface. So that's what this, this video is going to talk about, is uh, what is SPI, how does it work? Let's jump in. Basics. So... There is a, in an, in an SPI world, there is uh, this notion of master and slave. In general, the integrated circuit is going to be your SPI slave that you're talking to, and the SPI master is either going to be a microcontroller or, in our case, an FPGA. The SPI master always initiates the transaction, sending or, sending or receiving of any data, and it does so with these four signals. So there's S clock. MOSI, MISO, and SS with a bar on top. And I'll go through the list. Uh, S clock is your serial clock. So this is a, because there is a clock, it is a synchronous interface as opposed to an asynchronous interface like UART, for example. UART is universal asynchronous receiver transmitter, meaning there is no clock. SPI has a clock. That's one thing to note. Uh, in general, interfaces that have clocks can generally go faster. So UARTs usually top out around 1 megabit per second, or 1 megahertz. SPI can go faster than that, 16 megahertz, 32 megahertz. Um, it can definitely go faster. MOSI, uh, master out, slave in. So if you look at the direction of the arrow, it goes from the master to the slave. So that's data going, and that's a data line. So that's data going from the master to the slave. MISO is master in, slave out. I actually like the naming on on SPI, because instead of just TXRX, it's like, okay, who is it TXing to? Is it a TX for me, or is it a TX for you? TX and RX is not great. MOSI and MISO are actually more descriptive uh, of a word, so I, I like those. Uh, I like that about SPI. Um, MISO is master in, slave out, so that's from the slave back to the master. So if the master wanted to get data off of an ADC, for example, it would be reading the MISO line to get that ADC data. If it wanted to write data to uh, an EEPROM, some sort of programmable memory, you would be writing it over the, the MOSI line. So out, in. Um, and then SS is slave select. I call it chip select, but um, SS or, or slave select or chip select, either way, the bar on top indicates that it's active low. So when it goes low, that's when things are happening of interest. And when it goes back high again, nothing's happening. So those are the basic... Uh, those are the basic data lines and clock lines for a single interface from a single master to a slave. Now the interesting thing about SPI is that you can have multiple slaves on the same line, such as this. So in this situation, the master has the same S clock, MOSI, and MISO, uh, but now there's three slave select or chip select lines instead of just one. And the purpose of that is uh, if you assert, these are mutually exclusive, so you can't assert two at the same time, but if you want to talk to the green slave, you can assert slave select one low, and now only, only the green one will be hearing the data that's coming out on clock, mosey, and miso. 
Um, it's basically, it's like an, you know, the ability for the slave to open its eye or, or look at the data. They're all, all three of these are going to see S clock, Mosey, and Miso toggling, but only the one that has slave select driven low is going to actually do something about that data. So they're all going to go like, hey, something's going on, but slave select's not active for me, I'm not going to care about it. Uh, that's one nice thing about SPI is you have this slave select, so you can use the GPIO pin to talk or not talk to some slave. Um, as opposed to something like I2C, I squared C or I2C doesn't have any notion of this slave select pin, so you have to use an address in I2C. That's built into the protocol where you say like address one is the green one, and address two is the blue, and address three is the purple. Um, and so the, each one needs to then decode the command and try to understand, is this for me? Is it not for me? Uh, and do a little bit more processing. This is pretty simple. If the slave select's not active, I'm, I don't care. I'm not going to respond. So I thought it'd be beneficial to do some advantages and disadvantages of SPI as compared to other common interfaces. So it's full duplex, meaning you can send and receive at the exact same time. So in the if you think back to that uh, diagram, you can have data going out on Mozi, master out, slave in. At the same time, data is coming in on MISO. So both directions at the same time means full duplex. Half duplex would be send, receive, send, receive, but you can't send and receive. Uh, in general, like I said before, it's higher speed than UART because there's a clock. I2C also has a clock, but the way electrically that I2C works, where it's got pull-up resistors and it's an open collector interface, it's a little bit slower. So I2C tops out at around 400 kilobit, uh, kilobits per second, 400 kilohertz clock rate. SPI can go 16 megahertz, 32 megahertz, like I said, without much issue. And a huge advantage, probably the biggest advantage, is that it is everywhere. I mean, it is all over the place with dedicated integrated circuits. Um, you know, you don't hear about it too much with, in commercial electronics because it's at, a, it's at a much lower level. Like, it's a very simple protocol. USB is much more complicated, but it interfaces to webcams and microphones and mice and all sorts of different, you know, commercial electronic products that you, you're, you're familiar with. SPI is more ubiquitous perhaps than USB, but it's at a much lower level. Uh, there are more pins so those are the advantages at a high level. A disadvantage could be there's more pins, so there's four pins at a minimum, and for every slave that you want to talk to, you need to add a new chip select. So if you have five slaves, now you have a three plus your five, so an eight pin interface. So that just grows linearly with the number of slaves that you want to add. Um, in general, it's good at short distances, but not good at long distances. So if you want to go further than maybe a meter, something like that, I would be very cautious about using SPI. Uh, just because it's a single-ended interface, meaning it's 0 to 3.3 volts, it's not differential, as opposed to like RS-45 or RS-232, are meant to travel a lot further. Um, I, I think RS-45 can go like a quarter mile, actually, without a problem. So if you have large data runs, you definitely want to be looking at not SPI. Uh, and a huge downside to it, I think, uh, is that there's lots of variants to it, which I'm going to get into exactly what uh, some of those variants, but making sure that your master and your slave speak the same language is, or, or, on the, or on the same SPI variant can be tricky. Something to watch out for, and I'll get into that right here. Okay. Uh, so, here is an example. This is summarizing... Uh, all four data modes of SPI. At a high level, there are four modes. There's mode 0, 1, 2, and 3. And each one of those modes specifies a CPOL and a CFA, or clock polarity and clock phase. And what those mean is, well, I'll look at clock polarity first. Clock polarity of 0 means that clock in the idle state is low. So here's the idle, before any bytes come along, this is showing the transmission of a single byte. There's eight, uh, there's eight bits being sent here. Um, so this is one byte of data transmission. And before the byte starts, you'll notice that the S clock is low. So that's a C Paul clock polarity of zero. C Paul equals one means that the, the clock line idles high by default. So that's one, var that's one variant distinction then, to make things even worse, 
there's C phi equals zero and C phi equals one. Uh, so, okay, so I'll just talk through slave select first real quick. Slave select goes low at the beginning of the transaction, which indicates that something's gonna happen and kind of gets the, gets the slave ready to be sending data, to be receiving data rather, um, or sending and receiving, I guess. So C phi equals zero and C phi equals one. This is clock phase. And what this means is what edge of the clock does the data go out on and does the data get sampled on? You always wanna sample your data if you're the receiver. You always wanna sample your data when it's not transitioning, right in the middle of the data. So if you're, if you take this first edge here, you wanna sample this, this first bit uh, right in the middle between when the one starts and the one ends. So in this case, it would be the pink line. You'd want to sample that data. Uh, that gives you the best probability of having of not having a metastable condition. Metastability basically, uh, really quickly, just means that if your data is changing, uh, then you could potentially get a zero or a one. You don't know which one you're going to get. Um, so you never want to be sampling your data like while it's changing, while it's in the process of changing. You always want to sample it when it's been stable for the longest amount of time possible, and it's not about to change to another state. So the uh, C phi equals zero and C phi equals one just means which edge of the clock are you using to change the data and sample the data. And this is confusing, and by far the worst part of SPI, in my opinion, is why they came up with these four now there's four variants because it's clock polarity zero clock polarity one c phi equals zero c phi equals one so there's four polar four different variants right here and some adcs talk on mode zero some talk on mode three and making sure that your master can support all those modes and your data is aligned correctly is just extremely tedious and frustrating to me um something to be aware of uh, we'll talk through more details of of this later on it makes me kind of go like that so those are the basics of SPI. In a future video, I'm going to be describing how to implement an SPI master inside of the GoBoard FPGA. So if you don't yet have a GoBoard and you want to get started uh, learning some great tutorials that I have on nanland.com, go to my website, nanland.com, and buy yourself a GoBoard. They're available. Uh, if you already have one, thanks very much for your support. Check out patreon.com forward slash nandland for just five bucks a month. You can be a member, get early access to these videos, and help me make great content. Just keep me cranking out the good stuff. So I really appreciate your support there. Thanks very much.